it's old timey crimey. I am Christy. And I am Amber. And we are here this week with some historical, really messed up true crime for you. I love messed up true crime. Well, that's why you picked this one. <laughs> there was a moment, okay, there was a moment during the research in this one. It's, this does not happen often anymore. But there was a moment when I was like, eh, I probably have enough. I can probably stop. And then I encountered something and I was like, whoa! What? Yeah, <laughs> like, my research was very much the same. Yeah, I was like, okay, we're going to keep going then. Just going to plow right through because there, there are some weird details in this one. It's This guy was um, an interesting dude. He really was. So before we get to that, uh, you'll hear more about the Patreon later. But I just told Amber another story in our ongoing Aurora Slayer stories, which is probably not the Aurora Slayer But it's definitely a really weird mystery. Yeah, I think my theory is probably spot on, but you guys should give it a listen and let us know what you think. Absolutely, yes. And that's over on the Patreon, patreon.com slash oldtimeycrimey. So, Amber, my show notes for this are titled Descriptively Lurid. Mine are Teddy Hicks and the Wrong Dicks. (laughs) Oh, man. We are talking about Dr. James H. Snook today. That's S-N-O-O-K. It's a little bit of a weird name, but... Snook. Snook. Did Did it it all for the nookie? Snooky did it for the nookie. So, Snook was born in 1879 in South Lebanon, Ohio. He was a licensed veterinarian, and he taught at Ohio State University's vet school, and eventually became the head of the Department of Veterinary Medicine there. He'd also founded the veterinary fraternity Alpha Psi. So, there you go. In addition to that, he had done some inventing in his field. He invented the snook hook. Indeed. So, the snook hook is actually still used today to uh, spay animals. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's, he's had that uh, lasting impact on the veterinary field. On top of all that, he was a former Olympian. He was one of five men that made up the U.S. pistol team in 1920 and competed at the Antwerp Olympics. The team won gold in the 50-meter and 30-meter competitions. In the mid-1920s, he was an established member of the upper-class social scene in Columbus with a country club membership and his wife, Helen. They also had a daughter, and at that point, he had been married for four years. So, like, this guy has it all. He's the head of the department at the college. He's an inventor. He's a gold medalist. He is in the country club, like you said. And he's also, like, a a known horse surgeon on top of everything else. This is, like, cream of the crop society dude. Yeah, yeah. He's got it all figured out. His life is exactly... I I don't know what he could ask for that would, you know, make it better. His wife, Helen, was 11 years younger than him. They married when he was in his early 40s and she was in her early 30s. So this was a little bit of a late marriage for both of them by the standards of the time. She was probably considered an old maid by then. And he was probably considered a confirmed bachelor. Confirmed bachelor. Which I I think is 1920s for gay. Yeah. (laughs) Pretty much. Usually. But there were plenty of men who weren't gay and just didn't find somebody until later. But even a lot of, like, the old maids were actually probably just closeted lesbians. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I love when we stumble upon those stories of of they lived with their female roommate. Oh, yes. For 50 years. And they're just two old maids. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's not a roommate. That's a relationship. Yeah. (laughs) That is relationship goals, in fact. Yeah. So Helen actually taught science in the high school in Columbus. She had gotten her teaching certificate in 1918 when she was 28. They had a baby, but Snook's neighbors said they'd never actually seen him hold the child. And there was also a report going around town that the attending physician at the birth had had to resort to outside pressure of some kind just to get Snook to visit his wife and child in the hospital Once, for appearances sake. Once. Yeah, that is actually like kind of a thing. There are some men that are just deeply, deeply uncomfortable with the idea of childbirth, the idea of even their wife being pregnant. I've been there 
where they don't want to have any relations because there's a baby. Yeah. So, like, some... It's like, how do you think this baby got here in the first place? Right? <laughs> I don't want to poke it. All right. Listen. Aww. I really, I feel like we need to do, like, the anatomy courses for boys because, like, I, do you read this stuff online where they have no idea how the vagina works or mm -hmm. how a period works? They think that we get sexual pleasure from tampons. They think we can just hold our periods like you hold your pee? I can't even hold my pee. I've had three kids. <laughs> like, it, it's mind-boggling. And I really feel like we need to teach more about this. Because, uh, honestly, even from the, the other perspective, most of what I've learned about male genitalia came from drag queens. There you go. Because yeah. I did not know that it could do some of the things that it can do <laughs> until I worked with drag queens. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely need better education in this country, but we can't. We, it's not going to happen. It's, but it's, it's the unfortunate thing that we we both know. I. But still, just like make pictures of the clitoris and put it in a fucking book for the love of God. <laughs> Women everywhere will thank you, textbook people. Just, Come on, McGraw Hill, get on it. <laughs> Amber's got some tips for the publishing industry. I oh, I have murder tips too, but that will come later. Oh, boy. Oh, no, that, wait, that, that's in my other set of notes. So all in all, despite his complete apathy towards his wife and child, Dr. Schnook was considered, quote, a fine veterinarian, a very fine man, and a good neighbor. And a neighbor called him, quote, a model upright man. So I guess you don't have to give a damn about your kid and wife, and you're still a, just a decent guy. But that was also part of the times. It was, absolutely, yeah. He's making money and bringing it home, and they have a lovely home. Mm -hmm. And that's all he has to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's working at Ohio State University. I'm sorry, THE Ohio State University. THE OSU. I hate that. I hate it so. Now that's located in Columbus, Ohio, somewhere that Amber went recently. Uh, why do you think I picked this? Yeah, exactly. I figured it out pretty quickly. Yeah, I was literally just in Columbus, and I was like, I need. I had a lot of fun there, so I need to bring the dark side to Columbus because it was lovely, and I need <laughs> you to can't ruin have all the nice <laughs> things. This is what I do. I was like, I need a murder in Columbus. <laughs> well, Columbus, it turns out, is really quite the culinary capital of the world. It's the home of the very first Wendy's restaurant. Oh. And birthplace of Dave Thomas, founder of Wendy's. And also, Guy Fieri was born in Columbus. I think it's the actual Flavor Town. It might actually be Flavor Town. It's Flavor Town. I did not know that, <laughs> but that has made me very happy. So I need to destroy Columbus again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Ohio State University was co-ed pretty early. It allowed women in its second or third year of operations in the 1870s. Wow. That's one of the earlier co-ed institutions that we've seen. So I guess I can forgive the THE Ohio State University thing for the fact that they were pretty progressive as far as uh, educating women was concerned. Lovely. Yeah, it's second graduating class had a woman in it. That's awesome. Isn't that? Yeah. Let's talk about one of those students, a female student, a co-ed at Ohio State University, Theora Hicks. She was 22 in the mid-20s and had a job in the OSU veterinary department as a stenographer. Now, her history, she was born in Johnson City, New York in 1904. Johnson City is actually a village, and its motto is Home of the Square Deal. Oh, my. It's one of the weirder mottos I've ever seen. That's, uh... I'm sure there's some history to it, but I wasn't going to delve into no. it. Yeah, that's no. one rabbit hole I'll just leave alone. That's fine. They can keep their square deal. They can, yeah, that's, that square deal can stay over there. I will stay over here. Now, Theora also went by Teddy. She was an only child, and her parents were actually, uh, her mom was 41 and her dad was 39 when she was born. Oh, so they were up there. Mm-hmm, yeah. Now, at some point in her life, she moved to Bradenton, Florida, but the newspapers have her father teaching in New York public schools while Theora went to high school in Connecticut. So she's kind of moving around some, and I'm not sure exactly when or how. It's it's not clear. Boarding schools, maybe. Entirely possible, yeah. Finishing schools, Finishing. if you will. Finishing school. You're going to learn to be a lady. So she had some hobbies that she liked. She enjoyed tennis. She enjoyed golf. 
When she was in college, she liked to go for a long walk in the twilight before coming home to spend the evening with her nose buried in her textbooks. And as the 20s progressed, by 1929, she was in the advanced course for a medical degree at OSU, having completed the preparatory course. Yeah, so this is this is a smart, athletic, and by all accounts, very attractive young lady. And she's driven and ambitious. She's going to do things that a lot of women aren't doing at this period of time. Which is awesome. I'm it rooting is. for you, Teddy. Yeah. Newspapers called her, quote, a pretty postgraduate student. And they reported that her roommates called her quiet and studious, a modest, retiring, refined girl. Her roommates said she was secretive. They didn't really know a lot about her. She didn't seem to have any close friends. She didn't show much interest in socializing on campus. And they said she only had uh, a passing interest in men. But her roommates had seen her riding around town in a blue coupe with a balding, bespectacled, older Gentlemen, that man was Dr. James Snook. Jimmy Snook of the Snook Cook. <laughs> in 1926, Snook was 47, and Theora was in her mid-20s. She would be around the building doing her stenographer work, and they would chit-chat on occasion. Finally, one day, Snook offered Theora a ride back to her dorm. On their second drive, she learned that he was married. And she had him stop the car, she got out, and she walked home. She was not having it. But still, somehow, the drives became kind of a common occurrence, and they transformed into longer rides in the countryside, and then that turned into banging. Yeah, well, it also turned into, like, dinner dates. They would go eat at popular restaurants. So, like, I I think it was kind of more of a gradual thing. They worked together. They became friends. They started going on these drives. The drives were getting longer, and then there was dinner, and then eventually there was penetration. Well, it only took about three weeks. By his account. By his account. Yeah. But by his account, lots of things were different in the the timeline and the story. Yeah, yeah. One thing that I'm going to hammer home a lot here is that a lot of this is his account. And a lot of it is bullshit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So we're telling you as it probably was, and he's going to tell you things to victim blame. So, according to Snook, Theora was fairly experienced and told him that she knew more about sex than he did. Even gave him some reading assignments, including a book called The Art of Loving, written by a doctor. I could not find this. I found The Art of Love, but that was written by Eric Fromm in the 1950s. So way past this time. But The Art of Loving is harder to find because it just comes up with The Art of Love. (laughs) Because Eric Fromm was also a doctor. And Snook said she did indeed teach him more about sex than he'd ever known. But to them, it was more of a scientific matter than what he called a morbid interest. I don't know anybody. (sighs) Who considers sex a morbid interest anyhow? Like, he says, like, well, we weren't, like, normal people who, who think of sex as a morbid interest. We, we thought of it scientifically. I'm like, no, normal people don't think of it as a morbid interest. I don't know. Speak for yourself. Well, I mean, some of your sex is morbid. Yeah, it might be. <laughs> but apparently Snook did do his reading assignments. Although, that maybe wasn't quite enough to satisfy her, if you, uh, if you took her word for it, or rather took his word for what her word was. Theora had her own thing on the side. This was a guy who had recently graduated OSU and then became a professor of horticulture there, Marion Myers. He was also a pilot, as far as I can tell, because there are from the early 20s articles about him flying his plane around to like plant seeds and spores in areas that needed more coverage of those particular plant lives. So that was interesting. So this is Marion Myers, and, you know, Theora would just go ahead and tell Snook that he didn't measure up to Marion. Marion was better in bed than he was, and Marion had a bigger penis. Yeah, I'm, I'm unsurprised by all of this. <laughs> yeah. She even told Snook a story about how, back when Marion was a student, Theora and Marion had been having sex along the river, and the police caught them. And find them both $20, which is $320 today. But she gave both the police and the justice of the peace a fake name and address. Smart girl. 
And it does seem like Marion wanted to marry her, but she wanted to finish school first. There was a period of time where there was uh, what they call overlap between these two gentlemen. But then in the fall of 1928, Theora and Marion broke up. And Snook rented them out a little room where they could be together, which is repeatedly called a love nest. A love nest. A love nest. First, it was a room on Main Street, and then uh, they switched over to a room at 24 Hubbard Avenue. The Hubbard Avenue one cost all of $4 per week. That's $67 today. Snook also told the landlady that she didn't need to worry about cleaning the room because his wife would clean it every day. Because, of course, he and Theora were masquerading as husband and wife. Otherwise, it would be incredibly improper. He used either the name Howard Snook or the name James Howard to rent the room. That one's a little varies depending on the source. And he told the landlady that he was a salt salesman. Of all the things to come up with, salt salesman. I'm an importer-exporter. So he also would take Theora out shooting at a rifle range and said that she was a decent shot, which coming from him is pretty high praise. But despite how this may look, there was not really a strong emotional bond, at least according to him. He said it was a physical thing. And, quote, we didn't love each other. We satisfied each other's needs. In fact, she had told him that she wouldn't even marry him on a bet. Ooh. Yeah. And that he had a lot to learn about, quote, sex matters. So he was not getting her rocks off. It seems that way, yeah. And she, she definitely was willing to try a lot of different things for said rocks, including drugs. They enjoyed a bunch of drugs. There was cannabis and Spanish fly. She also took two medicines to help her self-diagnosed underactive thyroid. Those were thyroid extracts and thyroxin. <laughs> thyroxin, you get your rocks off. And uh, she used these both as a cure for her thyroid issues and to get her all pumped up for some good times in the love nest. And she apparently had Snook using some of these things too. She really seemed to enjoy experimenting for science. A lot of this happened after she took a pharmacology course. I guess it's important to, to take your schooling seriously and really apply what you learn in everyday life, including using cocaine to get a splinter from your finger. Why not? Sure, sure. She also, uh, he said, used Varanol, Barbitol, and Atropine Sulfate. That one is an anti cholinergic <laughs> and can also be used as a muscle relaxant, among other things. So she was chilling. He said she also knew exactly what she wanted in bed, and that was a little of the old S&M. She seemed to like to be the dominant force as well. So we know who was the S and who was the M. <laughs> no shame in her game. No shame in her game, yeah. So this affair stretched on over the course of three years. And it got to be more and more up and down, according to Snook. Theora got more adventurous and seemed to need to go more to extremes for satisfaction, at least extremes from his point of view. Um, one incredibly new thing for him was uh, her going down on him, which he said she, she did 10 times over the course of their three-year affair. Is that supposed to be a lot? It, to him, yes. Yes. He, uh, he did not feel that that was a normal thing that people did, and he had not had that experience prior to meeting her. Oh, my. Well, I guess, yeah, this is, everybody's a prude back then, um, but she is a girl after my own heart. <laughs> she is quite the girl, yes. She knows what she wants, and she goes after it. Snook also seemed to feel that the aura was getting more and more clingy as time went on. So. That's what happens with women. Women are more emotional creatures. The more you fuck them, the more attached they are to you, generally speaking. Generally speaking. Yeah, that's a generalization, but there are, like, hormones that come out. And I don't know if scientifically we have more of them or not. I don't know. I feel like the more... I think it goes both ways. The more orgasms you give a person, <laughs> the more they attach those feel-good feelings to you. 
Yeah, I can go both ways. That makes a lot of sense, too. Oh, so can yeah. I. <laughs> How you do it. <laughs> this is going to be Amber's favorite episode. There's so <laughs> many openings. <laughs> I love all the openings. I just got to stick things in them. All right, moving on. So, June 13th, 1929. The aura left work around 7.45 p.m. and told the switchboard girl that she was leaving for a date and would be back around 10. However, she never came back. And she didn't go home either. Now, her roommates thought that maybe she'd spent the night with friends and were surprised to hear that she'd been on a date and started getting a little concerned. So these roommates were Beatrice and Alice Buston, sisters. And the day after her date, when she didn't come home by the afternoon, they reported her missing. They're good roommates. Very good, yes. And that same day, at the rifle range where Snook had taught Theora to shoot, two 16-year-old boys were going to practice shooting when they found what they at first thought was a pile of garbage and then soon realized was a woman's body. They went to the police. Initial articles said that the body was missing an arm, but that turned out to be incorrect. About seven hours after the body was found, the roommates had identified her through her personal effects. She was also identified by a secretary at one of the women's dorms at OSU. So this is describing the identification. Mrs. Alice Moran identified the body, guided more by the fashionable brown dress with white collar and cuffs than the mutilated features. That tells you a little bit something about how this body, what condition it was in. We'll get into that in the autopsy. Oh, okay. I was going to say. Oh, just in very, very soon. I just have a little bit before that. So there were tire tracks on the rifle range that told investigators Fiora had been brought there in a car, but they didn't know whether she was dead or alive when she was taken there. But there were really not any signs of struggle on the ground that they could tell. Now, her wristwatch had broken and stopped at 10 p.m., the time she was supposed to be back at work. And we've only seen this occasionally, but there's just something about clocks and watches stopping at the time of a murder. Like, I know it's more likely to happen because of, you know, like, more physical contact and, you know, things are getting violent. Yeah. But there's just something that gets me in the gut every time I I see something like that. It's just like, it's like time really did stop when this person died. No, it did for her. Yes, it did for her, certainly. But it feels like it's more than that. It feels like it's more than just for her. It's, it's, a, it's a strange feeling. I can't, I can't really describe it. It's just this eerie, spooky feeling I get. So let's talk about the autopsy. Her head was crushed by something heavy, like a wrench or a hammer. Somewhere between 17 blows and two dozen blows. The autopsy also found particles of bone in her brain. So they really went to town on her head. Uh, there was, this was not in a lot of the articles. I think I only found this in the Daily News, which was a lot of my source for the more lurid aspects. They are very good for the details. They really are. Uh, Every other paper is like, I don't think we should tell people about that. The Daily News is like, yo, listen to this. (laughs) You gotta hear what we've got for you today. So apparently, uh, I hate this. A knife had been stuck in her ear in an attempt to puncture her brain, but the knife was too short. Hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it. There were wounds in her abdomen, but none of those were the cause of death. The coroner said that the cause of death was from her throat being slashed. Both the jugular and the carotid were severed. And the coroner said the slashing was not amateurish, but the work of a pro who knew his way around a body. I wonder who that could be. Hmm, I wonder. There was blood on her clothing that was human and later determined to be hers in the rudimentary way that they did. So, most likely hers back in that time Yeah, because they just blood typed back then, didn't they? Pretty much, yeah. They also checked her stomach contents. There was a beef sandwich, a bit of brown paper, four cucumber seeds, some strawberry seeds, Spanish fly, and cannabis. Apparently. 
Did you hear what they did for science with her stomach contents? No, tell me. They thought that she had been drugged, so they took some of the beef in her stomach and fed it to a dog who then acted strangely. <laughs> oh, well, that is science. 100% science right there. Yeah. Let's just feed things to dogs. That's one step past the point in history where people were like, he drank this and then he got very, very ill. I should drink this and see what happens. Maybe it's poison. Let's find out. Bottoms up. Right. It's almost the same thing as like, this tastes awful. Try it. Like, we just yeah. adapted it to keep doing it. Yeah. We were just like, okay, maybe we should try this on poor defenseless animals instead. Yeah, sure. Sure. So the police start asking around, and they get both descriptions of the man she'd been seen riding with and mentions of the name Dr. Snook, who matches the description of this older man she'd been seen with. So the police have him drive his blue coupe to the station for questioning. They also had Marion Myers come in for questioning, and while both of these men are being asked questions, their homes are being searched. They don't find anything at Marion's house, but they do at Snook's. They found a blood-stained shirt and hat. And they also learned from his wife that he had sent two suits out for cleaning the day before he was questioned. One of those suits was also blood-stained. You just send it to the damn cleaners? Like, right, right. As far as covering your tracks go, that is about the opposite. Uh, I got blood all over this. Here you go, dry cleaning. Like, I know that... Having worked at a university, I know the salaries aren't the absolute best, but um, I would think maybe you could afford to just buy a new suit, new hat. Maybe you should just throw those away. Burn them. Yeah. Burn them. Burn the evidence, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Yeah. They also found a hammer, which might have been a ball-peen hammer, actually. That's what I have in my notes. Yeah. And a pocket knife. Both of these belong to Snook, and both of these were blood stained. Yeah, it did say it, it seemed like he had tried to clean it, but like not thoroughly, which for somebody who works in like a medical field like that, you'd think he would like sterilize them. He has other people to do that for him. But at like, the level he's at, he's just got, he's got like veterinary assistants and students and interns and stuff. He never has to do this shit. And he really honestly did not think he was going to get caught. Yeah, and you know what, that is really true. But, like, at the same time, like, you do this for work where you have to get your stuff sterilized, at least. Why would you keep the blood-stained things? Oh, it's cute that you think they sterilize things. <laughs> they might have, but on animals? Oh, who cares? We're going to feed dogs bits of somebody's pre-digested stomach contents that we think contain drugs. Do you think we're going to sterilize shit before we do surgery on a horse? Fair. That's fair. No, we just got one horse out, bring in the next horse, <laughs> and so on and so forth. You know what? And at the time, they might have, they very well could have been doing that on like people yeah. as well. So, yeah, all right, never mind. I mean, the I take it back. Really didn't come into vogue in the late 18, until the late 1800s. And even then, if you did it too much, you were obviously insane. <laughs> we had in the tiny, believe it or not, somebody who, an actual doctor, said that she was the most dangerous kind of insane person because she washed her hands many times a day. I mean, really, if there's anything more dangerous than hand washing, I don't know what it is. They don't want to know where I put my hands all the time. <laughs> no, they don't, and I hope you wash them. So they, uh, the police questioned Snook about the bloodstained shirt. That seemed to be inconclusive. And then they were like, well... We're not going to question him anymore just yet. We're going to wait until we talk to all of the victim's friends and acquaintances before we really question him. I think maybe they were just trying to make him sweat. Or make him stupid. Because if you take him in and then you let him go, usually they're going to be like, I'm off the hook and do something really fucking stupid. That is true, too. Yeah, that's true. So Marion, who hadn't been with Theora for over a year, he was also questioned. But his alibi was solid, so they had him identify the body and then set him free. They just need to have everybody identify the body. If, if you've ever met her, if you were a cashier at a grocery store and she came through her line, we're going to need you to come down to the morgue and uh, check out this incredibly mutilated, bashed human being here and tell us if it's the person you saw. I guess. Why not? Sure. Helen Snook was also questioned because um, the police found... 
in Theora's hand some hair that she was clutching. And they were like, well, this is a woman's hair. Maybe the wife has some involvement. But their determination eventually became that the hair was Theora's herself. She had maybe grabbed at a, a wound in her head or something like that, and it came off. So they finally, finally interrogate Snook. The official interrogation lasted from 10 a.m. on June 20th to 5 a.m. on June 21st. That is 19 hours with not really any breaks, or hardly any. The officers even worked in relays. But Snook didn't have anyone to come in and take his place. One paper reported that they had specifically set this up in order to break him, because they felt that he was making fools of them. Quote, Here was no ordinary individual, and methods used on the average criminal to secure a confession were without results in this case. So they're like, okay, we got to break out the big guns. So they gave him the third degree. Now, I did actually look up this paper that was in the University of Pennsylvania Law Review in 1937 um, regarding a 1930 report on the practice of the third degree as it was used back then. So we actually have a, a pretty good description of what they were doing and what their tactics were. Quote, the third degree that is, the use of physical brutality or other forms of cruelty to obtain involuntary confessions or admissions, is widespread. Protracted questioning of prisoners is commonly employed. Threats and methods of intimidation, adjusted to the age and mentality of the victim, are frequently used, either by themselves or in combination with some of the other practices mentioned. Physical brutality, illegal detention, and refusal to allow access of counsel to the prisoner is common. Another interesting note is that in 1930, there would be a number of cases where convictions were reversed by appellate courts because of confessions obtained with the third degree. Yeah, because I have in my notes that they actually did beat him. They hit him on the face and the body, yeah. And did you have anything about the syphilis test? I don't have that. I found one source, and this is really interesting. I'm going to go ahead and note that like, I'm not 100% on this. But there was one source that said during his third degree, they performed a spinal tap on him to check him for syphilis and damaged his spine. Okay, I did have the spinal tap, but I thought that that was done by the alienists in some of their diagnostic procedures. It could have been, and it, it could have just been like a, a weird wording of it. But so they give him the spinal tap to check him for, for syphilis or whatever and damaged his spine somewhere during all of this to the extent that during the actual trial he had to sit in like what like a beach chair yeah yeah he had a beach chair because it was too difficult for him to sit upright in a proper chair i mean i feel that <laughs> you know and i get that but could you imagine being like abused in that way yeah. like you would probably confess just about anything too yeah, I, I really feel like the spinal tap didn't come in until later, until the alienists, because he had like three different examinations by alienists, but they might have also, through that, I don't know if a spinal tap can be used to check for syphilis. It, they might have thought that back then. They might have used that because syphilis can also cause, um, you know, insanity. Yeah. So they might have been like, well, if he's syphilitic and in the late stages then maybe that's a cause for insanity, so we should check him for syphilis. Or it's just a reason to give him an unnecessary spinal tap. Also that, yeah. On purpose. That's, that's, that's really likely, actually. So, he does give them a confession. So we're going to go through that. He told them about his um, relationship status. He said, quote, I regard my wife very highly and respect her very much as a wife, but she lacked some of the companionship afforded by Miss Hicks. During the three years I knew Miss Hicks, I did assist her in many ways toward an education, but I found out it wasn't as appreciated as much as I thought it would be. He had a bandage on his hand when he was brought in. He said it was from an accident earlier that week when he was fixing his car and the wrench slipped. Police surgeons checked out the hand and figured the injury was several days old, but it had been uh, several days ago. Now he told the police the series of events that happened the night of the murder. And again, this is his version. He'd come to campus at 7.45 to finish up some work. 
Then he went to his golf club because he had left his shooting glasses there. And then he went home and went to bed. They asked him when he had last seen Theora, and he said Wednesday, which was the day before the murder. Now, Snook said the highlight of this, and it seems like the moment that really got him to open up about the truth, was when young city prosecutor Jack Chester slapped him across the face three times and said, Damn you! Go ahead and tell the story! You have got to tell it! And we know you know more! You must tell it! The police chief did verify that this had happened and said that his response had been to mild reproach attorney Chester. Now, Mr. Chester, don't resort to that. That's just it. And Chester admitted to it, too. He said, I slapped him three times. I admit it. What man wouldn't? Felt good. Wanted to do it. Did it. I kind of want to slap the guy, too. I'm not going to lie. Yep. So, Snook did tell them he'd had an ongoing affair with Theora. He told him about the love nest and said, all right, what I told you first about me just, you know, going to the club and then going home wasn't entirely accurate because I actually picked up the aura and we went to the range to talk. We had an argument. She threatened to kill my family and then also to even kill me. She was getting her purse and moving to leave the car. I thought she was going for her gun. She had this 41 caliber Derringer that I gave her. And so I was like, well, damn it. I can't have her shooting me, so I reached into the back seat for my hammer, and then I hit her on the head a bunch of times. But, like, so I'm going to back up just a little bit because I love why they went to the shooting range. Because Teddy wanted to go somewhere that she could scream. Yes. I love that (laughs) so much, and I feel like that that should be just, like, a catchphrase. Like, take me somewhere (laughs) where where I I can can scream. scream. Whether that be out of anger or lust or whatever... Take me somewhere I can scream. I love it. I think there was actually a play of some kind. There was. And it's called Somewhere I Can Scream. Yes. Yep. (laughs) So this is how he phrases it, the attack itself. Quote, in the struggle, she was hit on the head with a hammer with the intent to stun her. And that really, if I were still currently teaching technical writing, I would probably use that as an example to my students of a really great use of the passive voice and how you can try to shirk responsibility with it. I don't teach them to shirk responsibility. I teach them to notice when other people are doing it. Yes. It's ethical technical writing. He said she continued desperately and an increased number of blows of increasing force were necessary to stop her. Realizing then, no doubt, that her skull was fractured and to relieve her suffering... I severed her jugular with my pocket knife. Although, in later, he'll say he has no memory of that. And there's a note. This will differ in some significant details with what he'll later say on the stand, but not in the details you might expect. He also said that uh, after the murder, he threw Theora's purse in the river, and only when he did that did he discover the gun wasn't even in the purse. She had left it at home. There was no danger. He he would have been fine. So then he went home, had a bite to eat, read for a little while, and then he went to bed. You know, as you do after you murder your young lover of three years. As you do. So in the end, Snook was charged with murder, and he was put on trial a little over a month after his arrest. Again, justice, as it were, moves very quickly in these time periods. Now, Snook hired three attorneys, one of whom was a former municipal judge who was so certain of Snook's innocence, which Snook himself had assured him, I'm I'm quite innocent, I'm 100% innocent, that this attorney and former judge told the press, quote, If Dr. Snook killed that girl, I helped him do it. That is a really dumb thing to say to the press. That is incredibly stupid. Yes, very, very. Yeah, this is the guy I want on my team backing me, somebody who's dumb enough to say that if I, the person charged with the murder, actually did the murder, then he was there too. I feel like I would just point fingers and be like, you heard it yourself, the attorney did it. Right? Yeah, he confessed right there to you. <laughs> I was I was just standing there watching. I was supervising. I prefer a more of a management role. I think I'm I'm just my personality is more oriented towards telling people what to do and delegating. 
Yes, I delegated. I'm a delegator. Oh, and then in the lead up to the trials, when I have that, he had those three examinations by alienists, and one of them included a spinal tap. Who knows? Maybe they gave him like eight spinal taps. You know what, though? So this did move really, really fast. So fast. Yeah. So it's it's possible that they were jammed together pretty quickly between the interrogation and, and then the three examinations. Yeah. Quote, unquote. The trial itself was three quarters as long as the wait between the murder and the trial. Yeah. Yeah. It was four weeks from murder to trial. It was three weeks from trial to end of trial. And before it could even begin, this trial in the summer of 1929, was be- it was being dubbed the trial of the century by the press. As almost every trial is. You know, you really got to wait until the year is 99 before you can start saying anything is the anything of the century. These people did not know OJ was coming along. They didn't even know TV was coming along. They had no idea. They had no idea. So there were some really interesting things in the papers in the lead up to the trial that I think show a lot of where the public stood on this. Because, you know, letters to the editor or you can send in little poems. We have both. This is a poem that is signed Charto. Okay. Yeah, sure. And three weeks before the trial, this poem was published in the Akron Beacon Journal. A Columbus horse doctor named Snook, whom nobody thought was a crook, got into a fix with a lady named Hicks. So now he is destined to cook. Okay. Sure. It's very susical. It is. It is. Yes. That's a lovely limerick. Nobody goes to Nantucket. And so then there was a letter to the editor published in the same paper titled Gentlemen of the Jury with an exclamation point, which basically says we shouldn't even bother with the jury. So it's kind of funny that it's titled that. But this is what this letter writer says. If Snook is not sent without delay to the electric chair, then we may as well scrap all the electric chairs in the country and also all other modes of punishment. There is no question of his guilt of first degree murder, for he himself admits it. And the case needs no jury trial. In fact, this case should not be interested to a jury. One word from them may defeat justice. The judge should have the backbone enough to send Snook at once to the electric chair. So if we don't send this guy to the electric chair immediately with no jury trial, as is guaranteed by the laws of our land, then we should just have no laws. I'm okay with no laws. (laughs) Amber's really on board with this, actually. She wants to subscribe to this guy's newsletter. (laughs) No, I don't care about what he says, Yeah, but I'm totally okay with no laws. So as a result of all the publicity, people are camped out starting at 3 a.m. to get seats in the courtroom. One of Snook's attorneys got death threats against his daughter. That's scary. Yeah, that's scary. She was like in her teens and she had to like go with him to court because he was like, I want to protect you. I was like, no, just send her to a safe house or something. Send her somewhere where nobody knows where she is. Awesome. Guys, I understand you're mad at people. Don't threaten their kids. Their kids had nothing to do with it. Yeah, don't do that. But they were trying to, they weren't even doing it out of necessarily strictly anger because the threat also included, you know, if you don't withdraw from the case, I'll kill your daughter. So they're trying to get some sort of action out of this. That's, yeah. that's the call to action on this. It's the call to action. On this note made of magazine clippings. So Theora's parents were in their mid-60s. And remember, this was their only child. They came to the trial at first, but after the first five days or so, they stopped. Really seemed like they were struggling to handle this, understandably. And actually, that was pretty much the time it took to put the jury together. For how long it took, five days, it didn't seem like there was actually much attempt made to ensure that the jurors were as unbiased as possible. The jury ended up being composed of 11 men and one woman. There was another woman on the jury, but she chatted with one of Snook's lawyers and got kicked off. Not only did she chat with him, she was caught on film doing so in the court cafeteria by the Daily News. Thank you again, Daily News. Exactly, yes. So another woman replaced her, and she, quote, elected to go on a sightseeing trip through the county jail, end quote, rather than go with the other jurors on a weekend hike. She didn't actually get a chance to see Snook on her little tour of the jail, which is totally normal for a juror to do. Why not? 
So the uh, defense's attempt to turn this into a mistrial was a misfire. Mm -hmm. I'm so proud of me. Now, Snook was apparently feeling, as we said, a little bit under the weather after his lumbar puncture. His chair was orange and green striped and sort of like that canopy kind of canvas material, like an awning, I guess. The prosecution called 21 witnesses and the defense called 42. I guess this defense was like anything you can do. I can do twice as much. So as far as evidence and arguments, what does the prosecution have? Well, they have the blood evidence from the car, pocket knife, hammer, clothing. They also had essentially the defense's argument, which they took on the very first day and spun around and used themselves in their opening statements, which is really smart and devious. The defense was going to use this argument that Theora had dosed Snook with some kind of, quote, sex-stimulating drugs, and that had driven him mad. So the prosecution takes this, and in their opening statement, they say that actually, the night that Theora and Snook went out for their drive, she refused to go back to their love nest. And so he dosed her with drugs which they were found in her stomach. Yeah, we have proof of that. Mm -hmm. We at least have proof that they were in her system. We don't know exactly how they got there. The prosecution says he sprinkled, quote, the strongest potions known for stimulating the emotions. <laughs> <laughs> On to the sandwich, and those were found in her stomach contents. And we mentioned earlier, those were cannabis indica and Spanish fly. She's an indica girl. Indica girl, not an indigo girl. <laughs> and then when they got to the shooting range, and despite all of the emotion-stimulating potions in her system, she refused him, and that drove him mad, and he murdered her. Or not even drove him mad, just drove him angry. <laughs> drove him angry. Because they don't want any sort of hint of him going mad, you know, as they would say back then, because that could be used for an insanity defense. So then the defense got up to do their opening, and the lead defense attorney, Ricketts, he just got thrashed by the Daily News. Oh, my God. Ricketts couldn't seem to get started. His full, fat face became purple as he sputtered and shouted. He appeared on the verge of a stroke. I can't really tell whose side the newspaper is on because they also call the prosecuting attorney Handsome Jack Chester, vigorous young D.A., Mm. Really, really hard to tell where the bias is here. I can't, I can't see it. It just looks like uh, they're just trying to get both sides, you know? I bet they are. So Ricketts kind of seems to have to come up with something on the fly because the prosecution stole his argument. I mean, he could just tell his argument. That would have been the smart thing to do. If he had told the argument as he originally planned it, that it was all Theora who did the dosing to Snook, then it's just, he said, she said, sort of. You know, two sides of one story. But instead he gets up and says, for some reason, he says, everybody was insane. Everybody was insane. Snook was insane at the time of the murder. The aura was insane at the time of the murder. Marion Myers, who was nowhere near there, was insane at the time of the murder. Marion's probably sitting there like, what the fuck? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sure. He's like, I, I, God, quit dragging me into this shit. And the defense attorney said there was no premeditation. It was all both self-defense and insanity. He's going for both. Oh, okay. He's going for the double gold. The jury got to go on a field trip and retrace the path that Snook and Theora took. The night, quote, the Ohio State University professor hammered his paramour to death. As well as the murder scene and the exterior of Theora's apartment and Snook's red brick house, quote, where the horse doctor lived with his wife and baby doc doctor. No, baby, baby doctor. His baby, baby doctor. doctor. His baby daughter. And of course, the, quote, miserable furnished rooming house where the med student and the bald headed man maintained a love nest. Wow. Yeah. I'm loving the daily news. They just take everything and they make it so much more vivid to the extent that you know that some of this is exaggeration and overblown, but it's also so fun. It is so fun. So I enjoy it. 
The jurors got to hear from a newspaper reporter who said that Snook essentially confessed to him 12 hours after confessing to the police, gave him a lot of the same story. And the reporter said that Snook had told him, quote, ours wasn't a silly damn full affair. It was a temporary arrangement. She was a good companion. Who has a temporary arrangement for three damn years? Yeah, after after year one, I think it's no longer temporary. I guess there was a break at some point, at least in Snook's telling, because Marion Myers knew about it, and he was like, Snook needed Marion to go and help Theora out when she was in another city. And Marion was like, I'll go if you'll stop seeing her. You know, I'll go if my relationship actually has any chance of being a relationship, if you're not around. And Snook was like, yeah, okay. But then the whole... You know, Marion wanting to get married and Theora not being ready thing happened. They broke up and then she got back with Snook. So the better part of three years, I would say. Okay, so that's a lot of what the prosecution has, at least as far as evidence they're bringing in. Let's talk about what the defense has. They have a character to smear. And whose character are they going to smear? Theora's, of course. Of course. Of course. Yes. This is from uh, James Willis in Central Ohio Legends and Lore. Quote, as far as the defense was concerned, Theora Hicks was a manipulative, sex-crazed drug addict who had managed to wrap Dr. Snook around her finger. She was prone to fits of rage, during which she was capable of almost anything. We have to say almost anything because she didn't even have the damn gun. She couldn't shoot him because she didn't have a gun. So Snook's wife and mother were present at the trial for most of it. His father had died two years before. His mother was 73, and she testified as a character witness. She cried on the stand about how wonderful her son was, how great he had been as a child. He had loved animals from the very beginning, and he would prefer to sit inside and read about animals rather than run around with the other kids, and said he called her every Mother's Day. I know phones weren't, like, <laughs> I know it was probably expensive, but damn. It doesn't take a lot to, to be impressive, I guess. Apparently not. And then Helen Snook takes the stand, and she says she's just totally clueless, and she's still in denial. Um, she said that he was a calm and passive man, never angry. Quote, the husband I knew could not have done this thing. She also said their relations, as they were referred to in court, we're about normal. Yeah, so never. It seems, rarely at least. Not all of the character witnesses that were brought up were helpful, especially once the prosecution got to them on cross-examination. Two of his colleagues at the university admitted that they knew that Snook had given women morphine and tended to carouse with other women and that his work was slipping. Well, and there is also uh, one source that said that Helen had perjured herself because years prior to this, she had talked to a lawyer about getting a divorce hmm. because she knew that he was screwing around on her, mm -hmm. whether that be with, with Teddy or just with some of the other women, because this seems to be a trait. I don't know. But she did at some point speak to a, di a divorce attorney. I didn't know that. Interesting. But she didn't do anything with it. So it was probably like, you're better off just staying home with your child and getting all of his money. It was either that or we don't really know the timeline. We don't know when she got pregnant. She could have been pregnant or like gotten pregnant shortly after. Yeah, or yeah. figured out or found out she was pregnant shortly after and then been like, well, eh, can be a little rough out there on my own here yeah. in the 1920s. I'll stay. Here we have uh, the, the character witnesses that are being brought basically making Snook look real bad as soon as the prosecution gets to them. They said that they cautioned him for giving out the drugs. And they said the affairs were just incidental, but they did consider firing him for his performance. So just, you know. So did his lovers, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Now, at the time of the murder, the dean of the veterinary school was actually on vacation and considering whether to let Snook go. If only. Maybe you should have done that before vacation. I'm just saying. Ooh. So as the trial was ongoing, there's this confession 
that Snook gave that's hanging over his head. So he retracts it. And yet when he took the stand, this is when the lurid stuff about his sex life with the aura came out. It, it gets descriptively lurid here. Thank you, Daily News. So a lot of papers, including the Daily News, didn't print all of this, but a court stenographer took the notes from the trial and published them on their own. It was on the newsstands in Ohio until the locals and the police stormed the newsstands and took all the pamphlets. Also, um, the Daily News does go into a little bit more detail than the other ones, so we get, we get less kind of tiptoeing around and a lot fewer euphemisms, or at least easier to understand euphemisms. And just a note that um, his mother made sure to be out of the courtroom when he took the stand, but Helen stayed until he started talking about the aura, and then she slipped out. And actually abruptly stood up and then slipped out. <laughs> Seemed like she maybe had planned to stay. Then was like, oh, no, I can't listen to this. I don't want to hear any of this. Exactly, yeah. I mean, who would? So the real details <laughs> come out when he talks about the night of the murder. So, you know, buckle your chastity belts. Um, gird your loins. <laughs> gird your loins. The Daily News says this about the, the moment when he first started talking about his affair with the aura. The court was compelled to send the sheriff and several deputies to quell a near riot in the halls. Hundreds of shrieking, yelling men and women loudly demanding admittance to a courtroom already stuffed to suffocation. The disorder was so great that the building was ordered cleared. Wow. People are going nuts. It's another sex riot. I love sex riots. Sex riots are the best. Snook finally came out and said, no, we weren't going to the range to talk. She said she wanted to go somewhere where she could scream, so we went out there. We tried to have sex in the car, but it was too small. The car, that is. No, not me, not me. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. perfect, perfect down there. Sure, it was the car. Yeah. And so it didn't really do anything for either of us. He said that he needed to go because he had some family shit the next day. He and Helen and the child were going to his mother's house. And this is the moment when he says... He says the aura flipped out on him. She said, damn your mother. I don't care about your mother. Damn Mrs. Snook. I'm going to kill her and get her out of the way. And then threatened his daughter's life and his own. And I'm just going to put this out there. This next part is going to be a little uncomfy if you happen to have um, male genitalia. I mean, I don't have male genitalia and it's still a little uncomfy for me. So plug your ears or fast forward for about one minute. If you can't bear to hear about someone hurting your, your colonel and the lieutenants during a sexual act. There's the vague explanation. You know what, though? I have something else about the colonel and the lieutenants. We'll get there. We'll get there. I know exactly what you have. Okay. I know. I know. All right. So, are the guys gone now? Okay, ladies, we ride at midnight. <laughs> We're going to infiltrate the clothing stores and put pockets on all the things. But that's only step one. That's just so our hands are free. Big pockets. Big pockets. His testimony described how she told him, quote, you've got to help me out. Then she undid his pants and went down on him. His description of this was, she didn't do it very nicely. And he described both unpleasant biting and pulling actions on his equipment down there. I simply could not stand it, he said. So that's when he grabbed something out of the back seat and hit her. Quote, I finally got her loose, very nearly twisted her arm, and she sat up there a little bit and said, damn you, I will kill you too. So this is the point where people are coming back if they went away to not have to listen to that. She went to get out of the car, grabbing her purse, and he said he knew that she was going to get the gun and shoot him. So he hit her again and then again. Quote, she slid right on the ground and I followed her out. I got up behind her and hit her once more with the hammer, and she went down, and her head hit against the running board of the car, and that is, that is all I can remember of hitting her. And again, he says, I don't remember the punctures to the abdomen, I don't remember slitting her throat. I don't remember stabbing her in the ear. Yeah, I know, right? Jesus. One would think you'd remember that, because I'm going to remember it for a long time. The stuff about the oral sex came out on the stand. This was not part of his original confession. 
So this is all brand new information to the courtroom and they're losing their minds. When the prosecution got him on cross-examination, they asked, why didn't you mention this before? He said, quote, I was ashamed of it, ashamed of any sex perversion because I never knew anyone that would do that before. That's how rare oral sex was, apparently. What, you, you have a thought, I can tell. No, I'm, I'm just, like, it, it boggles my mind that, I guess it doesn't, though. It might have even been a thing where it's like, it's not something you mention in polite society. So he's dancing around it and trying not to mention it, even though maybe, maybe his wife did do that for him. Maybe somebody, another woman had done that for him. But I, he, it, I doubt it. Can you picture any of these like old timey guys like just going to town on like, it doesn't seem like a thing. Like, I, I don't think oral was a thing either way. Certainly wasn't for the women. I'm almost positive of it. <laughs> Not a regular thing. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think it, it certainly happened some because they even, they did have the term blowjob. I want to know where the term blowjob originated. Oh, let's, uh... How old is the term blowjob? At them online, baby. I'm just really curious. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, blowjob. Act of fellatio 1961 from blow plus job. Exactly what blow is meant is the subject of some debate. The word might have begun as a euphemism for suck, thus from blow, or it might refer to the explosive climax of an orgasm, thus blow. Blow my load. Yeah. The oldest verbal form appears to be blow someone off, 1933, a phrase originally among prostitutes. I'm not 100% certain, but I feel like I saw somewhere where he actually referred to it as such. Oh, which would then disprove Adam Online. And also imply that maybe he was uh, also uh, having relations with sex workers. Ooh. Maybe that's where he picked it up. I'm not 100% sure. Like I said, a lot of the, the reading is mixed up in my head because I have a lot of different sources for this one. But it's a possibility. So this is how the Columbus citizen described this day in court. Quote, the snook trial devotees have been rewarded for their long hours of standing in line and sitting in the stuffy courtroom. Thursday morning, they heard the dirt they have been looking for and then proceeded to not actually give us the dirt. Thank God for that stenographer, right? Yes. Yes. Love her. So the cross-examination with Snook is, is fascinating. The prosecution does the usual play-acting demonstration. They have Dr. Snook playing himself and the prosecutor playing Theora to act out the murder. Not weird at all. Even weirder, it almost seems like. It's a little hard to tell for sure from the way this is narrated in the papers, but it almost seems like it started out from the original position, shall we say, that the oh. was in. I'm not 100%, again, because you have to kind of read between the lines and you have to, they, they muddle it up a little bit, but it's possible that that's where they started this, this reenactment. What they're really looking for here is some confirmation that he recalls slitting her throat. Since that was the actual cause of death, that would go towards premeditation and really push along that first-degree murder charge. But he won't do that. He continues to insist that when he said he did that in his confession, it was under duress. So they can get him to say that he slit her throat, but they can't get him to admit to a blowjob. Yeah. Huh. Let's just make some shit up and blame the victim. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, the prosecution then reveals in their cross-examination that they have some letters that Snook wrote but did not sign his name on. Instead, he signed a pseudonym. Mabel. Oh. Mabel. He sent those to Theora. Yeah, I did see that they used pen names, but mm -hmm. it didn't have listed what their pen names were. Yeah, this was one of his pen names. And the Daily News itself calls these letters unprintable. God only knows what treasure lies within. Oh, wow. I really want to know what those letters said. The introduction of the letters made Snook and his counsel slump in their chairs. My. This was like, oh, crap, we're doomed. So, and this had people in the audience literally standing on their seats to try to get a look at Snook's reaction. They want a snook look. Mm. They want a snook look and they want a snook hook. 
So the letters had, quote, language reminiscent of the gutter rather than the university campus or the drawing rooms of decent people. Who are you talking about decent daily news? In them, Snook apparently went into uh, more detail about what he and Theora had done and also things he wanted to do. He also insisted on the stand that, yes, he had done these what he called unnatural relations, but she made him do them through ridicule. Mm-hmm. And his lawyer tried to spin this as obvious evidence of his insanity. If you want obvious evidence of his insanity, how about what comes next? How about this? Because in one of his letters is a reference to an operation he performed on himself. On himself. On himself. And again, if the uh, the colonel and the lieutenants aren't going to be happy with hearing about somebody performing the uh, an operation on those themselves, then maybe fast forward one minute, 30 seconds. So this is called a Steinike operation, and that's just basically a vasectomy. He gave himself mm-hmm. a vasectomy. So this is um, operating on the theory that halting sperm production increased sex hormones. Well, and also so he wouldn't get her pregnant. Well, yeah, that too, yeah. Um, He said he did it to help remedy a problem he'd had since childhood and to make a collection of wrongly made suits fit. I have no idea. (laughs) What is that about? Oh, did he have giant balls? I have no idea. (laughs) I wonder if he had giant balls. Was he the, the Hemingway? of veterinary uh, professors. And by Hemingway, I'm referring to my cat Hemingway, who, when we found him, had the biggest balls you've ever seen on a cat. It was like two ping pong balls bouncing around down there. It was absolutely obscene. I had to get rid of those things. (laughs) I did. I couldn't stand looking at them anymore. But he does insist that he didn't do the operation in order to become sterile. And I guess he had to have a little bit of um, downtime. Afterwards, of course. I would assume so. So after the operation, Mabel wrote to Theora, I'm so sorry for both of us, but don't give up until you hear from me again. It's best to keep off my feet and avoid certain excitement. He also referenced other conquests. My was a wonder, but not a dearie like you. I never even touched her knee, either bare or silk. Can you imagine? So a doctor testified that when he examined Snook, He did find scarring and discolorations on his genitals. But he said, that didn't necessarily have to be from the incident in the car. Because that's what Snook was saying at first. That could be from his, you know, self-operation. All right. That is the craziness. I cannot believe he did that. I cannot believe anyone did that. What kind of... what What is going through your head? Honestly, I, I'm leaning more towards he did not want to impregnate her. He had a really good thing going with her. He was enjoying it. Obviously, you can see that he lost all attraction for his wife when she became with child and then had no interest in her or the child. Mm-hmm. He didn't want to go down that road again. He has this really excellent lover. He does not want to make her with child. And she doesn't want any attachments to him. She wouldn't even marry him if it was on a bet. Yeah, so I I think it was more for that. And he was like, but it will also make me better in bed and my giant balls will fit in my pants. (laughs) So very strange. Closing arguments are given. The crowd gives the prosecutor a round of applause at the end of his closing arguments. The defense attorney uh, gives his final statements and places responsibility for the whole relationship on Theora's side, calling her the moving spirit in their affair. Yes, let's just blame it all on her. It was definitely the, you know, 20-something young woman, not the, you know, 40-something-year-old man who is more experienced and also is a pillar of the community and respected and uh, has a lot of ways of manipulating. The judge gives the jury their instructions. Snook should be found not guilty, if he killed Theora in self-defense or insanity, although if it's insanity, there does have to be a separate sanity trial. They could also find him guilty of first-degree murder with or without recommendations of mercy. Without a recommendation of mercy is a death sentence. 
with is a life sentence. And they also had the options of second degree murder, which would give them the possibility of parole or manslaughter, which uh, he would be he would be sent to prison for one to 20 years. The jury left to deliberate and they came back in. All right, everybody guess at home or in your car or at the gym or wherever you are and yell out your answer. All right, who had 28 minutes? Somebody did. And they found him guilty. Murder in the first degree with no recommendation of mercy. The jurors said it would have been faster, but as uh, James Willis recounted in Central Ohio Legends and Lore, quote, they needed several minutes to discuss the procedure for reaching a verdict before they actually voted. <laughs> Wow, they could have had this done in five. So this means that he is sentenced to death by the electric chair. He appealed. Those appeals were denied, even up to the Supreme Court. Helen begged the governor for clemency. She called Snook the most lovable man. He did it only to protect his home when that woman drove him to desperation. Why we always got to fight each other? I'm just saying. That clemency was denied. So on February 28th, 1930, that is six months and two weeks after being found guilty, Snook had, with his wife, a lovely dinner of fried chicken, mashed potatoes, creamed peas, salad, coffee, ice cream, and cake. At least the chicken was made by the warden's wife. I think she made the whole thing. That was nice of her. So after this big dinner, he then went to the electric chair. However, before he went to his death, Snook reputed his, quote, perverted characterization of the aura. He said that one of the alienists had actually put this idea into his mind, but that he alone was responsible for her murder. So he went to his death and still today stands alone as the only Olympic champion ever executed. He is buried in an unmarked well, it was initially an unmarked grave at Green Lawn Cemetery in Columbus. They did that because there was concern about possible vandalism of his grave. They might have even done another diversion to throw people off because there were reports that people with the last name Snook got telephone calls the night of the execution, informing them that the body of Dr. Snook was being taken to Cincinnati. And that's not what happened. Eventually, he did get a headstone, but it only has the first and middle name on it. So it's the headstone says James Howard. And his wife, Helen, was also buried without the Snook name, just her first and maiden names when she died in 1978 at age 88 in Cedar Hill Cemetery in Licking County, Ohio. Mmm, Licking County. Licking County. And then a, a final note. I was thinking about tricking you at the beginning of the episode, and I decided that would just be mean. There are other James Snooks who have committed crimes. I saw that. It's so weird. So in the 1800s, there was one who had a little robbery habit. Another James Snook at age 26 was also a murderer in the 21st century. He killed his father and injured his mother in 2002 in Lower Providence, Pennsylvania. Said God made him do it. And quote, he believed he was a reincarnated slave from the 1600s whose role in life was to prevent World War III and race wars. I guess there's a snook every century. Yeah, it's like weird. But also, he apparently haunts the cemetery. Our James Snook? Our James Snook. Well, of course he does. He's seen wandering the grounds from time to time. And uh, it's, they've been reporting sightings for like... 70 years. Well, I guess we need to go out to Columbus and find him and slap his ghost silly. Let's do it. I did have one other oh, little okay. piece. The daughter. Oh, yes. I had nothing on her because she's never even named or we don't get an age. Well, because she changed her name with her mother to her mother's maiden name. Okay. All right. And then she went to Hawaii. Oh. Where she became a teacher at a school that later was attended by Barack Obama. Huh. Okay. Well, there you go. Huh. I had no idea. All right, now give me a recipe. It's going to get weird in here. It's going to get really weird. I'm actually going to give you three recipes, and oh. I'm going to have you pick which one you would choose out of the three. They're, they're short. Okay. 
And they're all for sandwiches. Okay. These are from New Delineator Recipes in 1929 by the Delineator Home Institute. All right. So first we have liver and bacon sandwiches. No. Chopped bacon, cream, mashed liver, and salt and pepper. Blech. Basically mix it all up. Decorate the plate with a border of lemon slices and hard-boiled eggs cut into halves lengthwise with a sprig of cress or parsley on each. And this is your sandwich. Absolutely not. It tastes like pennies. <laughs> we have radish sandwiches, which is uh, radishes, of course, but also uh, your favorite, mayonnaise, as well as a half cup of potted ham. All right. Peel and slice radishes, dip them in thick, rich mayonnaise, and lay on thin slices of bread covered with potted ham. Okay. And then finally, the whipped cream sandwich. It has cream, powdered sugar, chopped nuts, and vanilla. Whipped cream very stiff. Add sugar to make it quite sweet. Few drops of vanilla and chopped nuts. Spread between very thin slices of buttered bread and serve at once. Whipped cream mixed with pounded nut meats spread on <laughs> buttered bread with candied fruits added is delicious. <laughs> nut meats. You had me at pounded nut meats. <laughs> okay, so I want you each to choose. If you had to choose one of these sandwiches that you had to eat, which one would it be? And I made a bet with myself that I... It's the nut meats for me. So whipped cream? I'll, I'll do whipped cream. Come closer to the microphone. Jackson. I would eat the radish and ham one. I think I would eat that one too. It sounds a little weird, but... Okay, I don't know either of you sure. apparently. I thought that, that Amber would go for the liver and bacon just because there is bacon in it. And I thought Jackson would go for the whipped cream because he has a sweet tooth. Thrown you for a loop. Really, yeah. I mean, I'm going to make these sandwiches, and I'm not going to know who's actually going to eat them. I, I will eat both the radish and potted ham and the whipped cream sandwich. I will not eat the liver one because that is... Liver is disgusting. It, it is. I it, agree It with tastes you on like that. iron. Yeah. And no amount of bacon can cure that. Yeah. I'm with you. <laughs> You're probably right. Yeah. So, all right. Thank you, Jackson. Oh, Are we sad. eating these? <laughs> We're not eating them, no, but... I mean, I'm not going to do anything with liver, I swear. <laughs> I honestly, like when Jackson walked into the room, I expected there to be like a platter behind his back for whatever I choose. One door, one, two, or three, I'm going to be eating a mystery sandwich. One of these days we will. <laughs> one of these days, but not today. I actually have to make for the sure. things. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. You we... knew I can't resist a good nut meat. I know. I know. I should have paid closer attention to the actual text of the recipe and realized what part of it would really draw you in. Next time, next time. Ah, uh, creamy nuts. Creamy nut meats. Of course I'm going to pick creamy nuts in my mouth. All right, so we have a shout out to a new patron, and she made a special request. Amber's already grinning. Uh, if I sing her name, she would like me to do it in a British accent. I can't wait. <laughs> because she said, she, she said, because she knows I'm going to butcher it. <laughs> so let the butchering commence. <laughs> All right, welcome to the Patreon. A little duck. No, I got it wrong. I, got, I, I checked the pronunciation and I had been practicing it wrong. <laughs> it's Doherty. Alyssa Doherty. No, I can't do it. <laughs> How do you say it? Well, okay, so say it British first. Alyssa Dor. No, I can't. I'm terrible at British. Alyssa Doherty? No, that sounds like seven different accents mel melded into one, none of which are British. Not one. I can do a little bit, kind of almost like, I guess a little bit Cockney-ish. Alyssa? No. See, she's got a tough name to do <laughs> in British. Oh my goodness. What you got? What you doing? I'm going to try to make Siri do it. <laughs> no, I promised her I would butcher it myself. But if you can make Siri do it, maybe I can copy it. We did do that with, um, here, watch this. <clears throat> this was Jackson's idea. What's my name? Your name is Alyssa Doherty. We made my Google call me that because I have it. Alyssa Doherty. Alyssa Doherty. There you go. There you go. But it's not Doherty. It's Doherty. Well, I... in, in the British lands, it's Doherty. <laughs> <laughs> Alyssa Doherty. Alyssa Doherty. There you, that's the best you're getting, Alyssa. Uh, I think you, you probably enjoyed the butchering. <laughs> so, there was lots of butchering. So probably the worse I do it, the better for you. So um, <laughs> something? No, no. <laughs> no. Anyhow, 
So yes, you can join Alyssa and also give me impossible challenges that I will fail at to, to make everybody laugh because that's fun. And uh, anytime at patreon.com slash oldtimeycrammy, you can also make your name into something weird or hard to pronounce or whatever and just mess with me and make me sing that. Do it. Or, you know, ask for an accent. One of these days, somebody is going to become a patron and ask Amber to erotically scream their name. I'm waiting for it. I'm waiting. Me too. Somebody please live up to my expectations. <laughs> make Amber erotically scream your name or whatever you want her to scream, really. <laughs> we take requests. This could Obviously. get interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, there's that. There's our Amazon wish list. There's merch. There's all this fun stuff in the show notes that you can access. You can also, also access our social media there. Um, just a million ways to support us or just even just come say hi to us. We appreciate it all. Don't forget to rate and review uh, wherever you listen to podcasts. If you can do it there, we definitely appreciate that massively. It's a huge help. And tell your friends about us. Tell everyone you know, and then uh, subscribe them to us on their, their podcast player on their phone if they happen to leave it out. I don't actually uh, condone you I do doing that with other people's phones, but we do have a uh, friend of the show, sometimes guest, and Patreon who does that. So, uh... <laughs> And that's how he gets to be on the show. Yeah. <laughs> so there so you go. I'm not saying you should do it. I'm just saying if you do it, maybe you can come on as a guest star. <laughs> Amber's promises are in no way promises of old timey grimy. <laughs> I said <FDIC> maybe insured. <laughs> so, all right. What you doing this week? I don't know where I am or what day it is. Uh, Today is Saturday, and you are in my home studio, surrounded by mattresses and box springs. I am probably going to still be like gardening because I'm still trying to do all that because I want to grow the food and the vegetables and the things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, probably doing that. I'm hoping I can go get a fence this week mm. and um, protect all my veggies from the bunnies and the things. Nice. What are you doing? Well, we are going to be putting up some uh, sound uh, absorbing panels in here and actually taking one of the box springs away and figuring out where the hell we're going to put that. And uh, getting ready to, we're going to switch out desks. We're going to kind of do a little, little mini renovation on the studio. And to make it more studio e, yes, and and hopefully the sound will be improved somewhat. That's the that's the hope and the dream and the goal. And we'll also get some more space back in this room since, like, a, a full probably quarter of the room is obscured and like out of reach because there's a box spring standing up and you can't get behind it. So yeah, that's what I'm doing. Fun, hooray! Putting things on walls, yay! Let me know; I can come down and help. That'd be awesome. You've got a lot going on this week. You don't need to be down here. I always stuff on have walls. a lot going on. <laughs> That's and so true. like if you give me an excuse to not do things, I'm gonna take it. But also like I can do things. Okay. All right, good. There we go. That'd be a little fun project for us. Okay. Especially if there's like a nail gun involved. There isn't a nail gun. They recommend like double-sided tape or command strips, stuff oh, like that. That's boring. But I yeah, know. sure, I What's can do fun? that. <laughs> so all right. Thank you so much for listening. And we will see you next week with another zany, bonkers tale of true crime, but hopefully fewer operations performed on uh, people that feature in the stories. He uh, snook hooked himself. He, he did. He snook hooked himself. Oh, man. No wonder he invented that. He was like, I might need this to spay myself someday. He, he was like the first recorded masochist. Oh, God. No. That was long before. <laughs> but the first recorded masochist to do that. <laughs> yeah, to do that, yes. So, all right. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. My sources this week are Nancy Patzer on Short North Gazette, James Willis in Central Ohio Legends and Lore, Find a Grave, Freeport Journal Standard, Miami News, Santa Fe, New Mexican, Akron Beacon Journal, Circleville Herald, Sedalia Democrat, and The Daily News. All of those newspapers are from newspapers.com. Uh, thank you, Chris Garcia. My sources this week are the Ohio Exploration Society, Crime Scribe, Medium by Amy Drake, and True Crime Blog. <laughs> I don't think you needed that after my sneeze. No, it was Oh, really? Yeah. I feel like that there's, would have spiked my, higher. My...
I think maybe because you turned or something. Oh, perhaps. I should also sneeze directly at you next time. <laughs> oh, there you go. There we go. That's the answer. <laughs> Clearly. You should have been sneezing in my face all along. <laughs> yeah, just to make it spike so we can see where I sneeze. Yeah. It's for the good of the show. Yeah, absolutely. We'll do anything for the show, including have a uh, snot blown in our faces at high velocity. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Snooks test... T- <laughs> <laughs> I'm while I'm clapping. <laughs> Did I stutter, bitch? <laughs> we ride at midnight. We ride at midnight. There's so many good outtakes in this one, I swear to God. <laughs> okay. I can do this. Sorry. His test. <laughs> Words. 